Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus for episode 2 of 5 on Human Connection. We're mainly focusing on love and how it works and how it affects your body. Make sure you check out episode 1 to see how it affects your brain and your body. But now we're going to talk about the different types of love and why we even have it. Why does it even do this to us? So, love is an evolutionary adaptation. It's widely accepted that in the evolutionary theory of love that Love functions to attract and retain mates for the purpose of reproduction. Because we are in love, we tend to stay together so that we can raise and care for our offspring. Ultimately, the goal for life in general is to pass your genes on, successful reproduction. And the feeling of romantic love that we experience is pretty much just a tool to help us reach that goal successfully, to get children out of development and into adulthood so that they can then spread their genes. Love is a series of checks and balances. It's a way to successfully have and raise those kids and keep the parents together while they do so. But humans might have different needs when they're choosing their mates, which is why people choose different partners. You know, just off the top of my head, you know, maybe I really love long legs, or maybe you really like certain colors of hair or skin or certain body shapes. All of those things are preferences, but maybe there is maybe something in our DNA that tells us that we prefer a partner who passes along genes that might have some adaptation. So to go to the legs thing, maybe my ancestors lived near predators and we were chased a lot. So my DNA is telling me I need to find a partner that can help me produce offspring that run really fast. Maybe. This is how people choose, not everybody chooses the same partners, you know. There's no way to actually know 100% who we're going to be attracted to, which is why we date. And sometimes we'll end up dating a lot of different people, and sometimes you'll end up sleeping with a lot of different people over your lifetime. And sometimes this is common in the animal kingdom as well. We mate for one night, and then you'll move on, and the sperm and egg that are there are all she wrote. In the animal kingdom, they don't have prophylactics, so it's a little different for them. But when some animals deliver their offspring, they might not nurture their children. That might not be a goal in that species. So snakes and geckos, they have you know, no interest in raising their offspring. Fish, as well, abandon their babies, some species, soon after having them, and then they never return. They never find out what their offspring was all about, what books they liked or whatever. Sea turtles, terrible parents, great creatures, love them. They don't raise their young. Pandas usually have twins, but they're going to abandon one of those two babies when they figure out which one's stronger. She's just going to pick the stronger of the two. Black bears generally have two or three cubs at a time, but if for some reason they only have one surviving cub, they'll just abandon it because that's just too much work. If you're going to go through the you know, trouble of motherhood, you want to raise two or three cubs. You don't want to just raise one. It's not worth the effort. Humans, on the other hand, we don't tend to work that way. We tend to love almost everything we produce. We form some kind of an attachment with our offspring in some ways more so than a lot of other animal species. And sometimes we form it to things that we don't even produce. That's how much we like to form these attachments. Example, some people really love their pets, like a lot. Like they call them their babies and they're their moms or dads and you know it's kind of weird but it does actually have some basis in you know, evolutionary science. So a study compared MRI data of women who were shown pictures of their dogs and pictures of their children, as well as pictures of unrelated dogs and unrelated children. When the women were looking at their own dog or their own child, they had similar neural activity, the neural activity in the midbrain associated with dopamine reward release, similar to the releases we talked about earlier, dopamine and, and reward center stuff, the same as romance and bonding. However, the photos of strange babies and strange dogs elicited a way lower response, and humans did get a little bit higher response than strange dogs, just because we are the same species. So at least the moms or you know, the women were looking at babies and saying, oh, that's a human. I love that at least a little bit. So according to this data, this MRI data, yes, you love your dog. You love your dog a whole lot. But evolution is telling you that you probably should love your baby way more and also love other human babies just in case because they're at least also human. According to a study published in Applied Animal Behavior Science, however, your dog doesn't actually love you back. Sorry. But we'll leave that for another week. If you want to hear more about that, tell us 
in the comments. And I just want to take a second and thank K Jewelers for sponsoring this episode. Every kiss begins with K. The interesting thing about love is it usually doesn't creep up on us. We're pretty aware when we're falling in love with someone. You know, most people kind of pick that up. But how do you know if someone loves you back? You know, how would we even know? We're talking about love tomorrow as well, so make sure you come back to Test Tube Plus for that. Also, make sure you subscribe so you get all of our episodes. And thank you so much for watching Test Tube Plus. You can come find us on Twitter at Test Tube, and you can find me at Trace Dominguez. Thank <laughs> you.